When you open your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 3, Luke chapter 3, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. Father, please speak to us this morning. We want to hear your voice, and we desire to understand the preparations that were made for you to come to be, be our Savior. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now in the 15th, this is Luke 3, verse 1. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate began governor, being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Eturia and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. You may be seated. Why would I read such a passage? <coughs> kind of an interesting passage. The reason is because all of the names that I just read were of real people who existed. I'm going to show you a little bit about them. And because this proves the historical accuracy of the scriptures and of the gospel story. So, uh, that's the reason their names are there, because you can verify these things actually happened. And I want to talk to you about a little bit this morning about the good news of Jesus Christ brings forgiveness. You know, without forgiveness, it's impossible for people to be, we say, born again, or to be able to go to heaven because of sin. And there's a moral decline of our nation today. I don't think I would have to argue with you about that point. Today, in the United States of America, and no, we're not the only one, but we're among nations, there are many things going on that are, are representative of the moral decline of our nation. There is abortion to the point of 3,000 unborn children per week being put to death. And we're rightfully concerned about the misuse of chemical weapons that kills 1,400 people in Syria. And I'm as offended as anyone should be about that. But twice that many unborn children are put to death every week. And there's not one squawk about it among most of the leaders of our nation. Pornography sexual immorality, breakdown of the family, violence. One week ago, a man who was attending our church was shot at five times Sunday morning. He was hit twice. He is in, still in intensive care. He's been through at least three surgeries since then. And he is stable. I thank God for that. So when I say violence, I'm talking about violence even in our own community. The prohibition of any Christian expression in public schools is its almost completely uh, prohibited today. Same-sex marriage is the law of the land. And it is now, by law, the, the right uh, gays, lesbians, transsex transgenders, and bisexuals to serve openly in the military. In fact, I knew what would happen is because the law gives them the right to do that, then they result in having a special protection and special rights. So that if anyone doesn't agree with that behavior, then your military career is threatened because you don't agree. There are instances going on right now where commanders are asking those who report to them, what is your belief about this? If you state your personal belief and it doesn't agree with theirs, 
the, the one that's asking you, you can be removed from your position of leadership no matter how long you've served or honorably you've served. That's what's going on. I call that a moral decline. It's sin. There are some godly politicians and some Christian leaders that are trying to fight the immorality in our land, but their efforts are mostly a delaying tactic, not really a return of the nation to biblical moral values. And I'm going to submit to you that it is futile and misguided for us as Christians to put our hope in the political process to fix all the widespread evil in our society. As much as I think we are citizens and we should pray and we should vote and we should speak up and write whatever is your opinion, that's our free speech in our nation and the soldiers and sailors and airmen fight to defend that right of our free speech. Nevertheless, to try to bring America back to traditional family values and moral reform through politics is like trying to put a tuxedo on a pig. Even if you get the tuxedo on the pig, he is still a pig and it won't do much good to transform the behavior of the pig because you have not changed the nature of the pig. In times of moral decline, what the world needs most is not only a political solution, it needs a spiritual solution. It needs God. It needs the power of the Word of God. It needs the Holy Spirit. And I was grateful that you sang about the ancient words this morning. I've not heard that song before, and I love it. It's a good song. Good preparation for the message today, for me. When times are bad, I'm going to suggest that the message that we need to hear is the good news of God's salvation. Because mankind has always been sinners, since the very first family. And the only solution that there is to the sin of mankind will never be self-effort, but it's always the salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. What we just represented in the bread and the cup here is the answer and the only answer to all these moral issues is for people to be born again and transformed from the inside, from your heart out. People need this, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're concerned about moral behavior well, God had the law, and he put the law out, and the law proved that man won't change his behavior just because there's a law. The law stands and will never pass away. It is right. But the law doesn't transform people's life. The Holy Spirit, who comes to abide within a believer, he changes your life. The scripture says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. That's the way to transform the world, is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why missionaries go around the world. And by the way, God did have an answer for this. We just read about it. It said, the word of God came to John the Baptist, Luke 3. The word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Eighteen years have passed since Mary and Joseph found their lost 12-year-old son, Jesus in the temple. During the years after their return to Nazareth, Luke says Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and in favor with men. John the Baptist continued to grow and to become strong in spirit and he lived in the desert until the day of his public appearance to Israel, Luke 1 verse 80. So because the world was spiritually in darkness, when John the Baptist began his ministry, John the Baptist began preaching a baptism of repentance. It means the world was going mostly in the way of darkness and the way away from God. And what John the Baptist was preaching was, you need to repent and turn away from sin and you need to start walking the right way. You need to follow God. You need to adhere to His Word, His law. You need to put your faith and trust in God and obey God. Jesus Christ, the scripture says, the light of the world is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the answer. He's the solution to all these issues. Now, times are especially bad when there's no word from the Lord. And I was telling someone recently, I said, one of the ways in which we know 
it is so bad is when the effort is being made to take the Word of God away from the public, away from private possession, away from public reading, away. And because that becomes a famine for the Word of God. In fact, that's one of the problems is when children aren't being taught the Word of God as they're growing up. They don't know the Word of God and they have no reason to think in a Christian manner or to act in a biblical manner because they don't know anything what the Bible says. Zero. And the gospel is rooted in actual history. The gospel illustrate, illustrates spiritual truth and moral truth. Now John the Baptist began his ministry somewhere around AD 29. It would be very difficult to assemble a more wicked group of scoundrels than this bunch. They're all listed in the scripture we just read. Tiberius, he was the Caesar in Rome. That arch there is his victory arch in Rome, the Tiberius arch. And he was a real person. Pontius Pilate, you know who he was. He was the governor of Judea. He was a real person. He existed. There is a stone that we found at uh, Caesarea Maritima, which has his name engraved in it in Latin. Pontius Pilatus, so it had his name right there, and we know he was a real person who existed. He was so despised and feared as the Roman governor of Judea, he was governor from 26 to 36 AD. So we know the death of Jesus Christ occurred between 26 and 36 AD, probably around 30 AD. I don't know the exact date, but around 30 AD. And, uh, Another one of the characters mentioned here was, was this guy, Herod Antipas. He was one of the sons of Herod the Great. Jesus Christ referred to him as that fox. This is a, a, a bust of the head of Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great. Another real person. People say, oh, this is, you just, the Bible is just a bunch of fic fiction. No, it's not. It's recording actual events and real people that existed. Do you see the coin that's right there? That's a coin with the only uh, image of Salome, the girl who danced and asked for John the Baptist's head, and he was beheaded. These are real people. They really existed. They were evil people. Herod and Tephas had John the Baptist beheaded at this place, Macarius. You can read about it in uh, some of the other historical writings of the time. It was a palace fort of King Herod the Great, which was inherited by Herod Antipas, one of his sons. And Herod Antipas is the one who had him put to death here at this fortress, one of many fortresses that Herod had uh, constructed in what's now Israel. Herod Antipas' brother is Philip. This is the only image we are aware of from him, and it's on a coin. Uh, that was coined during his, during his time of leadership. Herod Antipas, another real person. Lysanias, another real person. This is a bust of his head. These are all real things that happened. And then we talk about Annas and Caiaphas. They were high priests. And you would think as high priests they would be very godly spiritual men, right? I mean, a high priest should be most accountable to God of anyone. Annas was a absolute dictatorial tyrant high priest. He was interested in one thing, power, control, money. He was very rich. This, uh, these steps that are here are the steps that Jesus Christ was led up to visit the Sanhedrin at the house of Caiaphas, who was one of the sons of Annas, and it speaks in the scripture of Annas and Caiaphas, the high priest. In other words, Annas was removed by the Romans, but he still remained in power. And he and his sons, including Caiaphas, were the ones who maintained control of the priests of the temple, therefore over all the people. And these steps led up to a house. Caiaphas had a house of 6,500 square feet with a big meeting room, and that's where the Sanhedrin could meet with him at his home. And that's a real place. By the way, there's a church now up there that was built many, many years ago called Galicantu, and it means rooster crows. 
That's because this is the place where Peter was hiding in fear and denied Christ three times while Jesus was being inquisitioned in Caiaphas' house. Real place, really happening there in these things. It was against this backdrop of political and religious darkness that the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Praise God, God finally sent the word, the gospel. John the Baptist, remember, his father was a priest. His father had served as high priest. His father had gone into the, remember, the Holy of Holies? And the angel spoke to him there. Have you ever thought about this? John the Baptist was a son of a priest, therefore he was a priest. Therefore he was able to have served at the temple. He could have worn the most expensive garments. He could have eaten the best meat, the best bread. He could have had servants. He could have been well off. But John the Baptist gave it all up and he went out into the wilderness and began preaching for people to repent because of the immorality that was going on in the land. I can't think that the other priests were real happy with John the Baptist because he was telling people they need to repent from their sin. Even priests were coming out and listening to him preach. you got to get the picture here. He was the son of a high priest before Annas who was preaching there needs to be some repentance of sinners. He confronted the nation. He was the first prophet, by the way, in 400 years, delivering God's message, God's word, and God's warning of judgment coming for those who refuse to repent. You see, what had happened, and I don't know why God delayed so long. You say, why God delay so long? I don't know. But in bad times, we need a word from God about salvation because the only way for people to be changed are you listening to me? The only way for people to be changed is to be born again. Saved. That's how God changes us. So 400 years after Malachi, there came a man sent from God whose name was John. That's in John 1, 6. And we're not talking about the beloved disciple. We're talking there about John the Baptist. We don't know why God waited so long. The world needed a Savior. Why in the world did God wait 400 years? I don't know. I don't know why he's waiting now. I don't know why Jesus Christ doesn't come back right now and that's it. The day of the Lord. But he knows in his great wisdom and in his grace and mercy, he has a day. A day when he's coming back. And when Jesus comes back, Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Even those who reject God now and reject the Bible now and don't want anything to do with the Christian faith today, every knee will someday bow before Jesus Christ. King of kings and Lord of lords, he is. That day is coming. I perceive that it must be coming soon, but I don't know when it's coming. But when it's said, the word of God came upon John it was like a bright beam of sunlight into a dark room the word of God came upon John and he began preaching as a prophet for the first time in 400 years America's not even 400 years old yet we need a prophet we need a word from God. Oh, we do have the word of God. We're not lacking that. We need to proclaim it the way it is. What it is, all of it, no less. Listen. The world needs a word from God. That's what we need. The world needs a word from God. So when it says the word of God came upon John, that's the qualification for a preacher. You want to know the qualification? The message is God puts his message upon a man. He calls him to be his preacher and he puts his burden of his word on the man. It's from God. It's not from us up, it's from God down. He calls us and puts the word on us. 
A man who preaches God's word must always remember, it's not my word. That's why I said, and some of you don't understand what I mean, I say, it doesn't matter what I say, it matters what God says. Well, if I'm saying what God said, then that matters. If I'm speaking God's word, that matters. What I'm trying to say is it's not my words that count, it's His. It's His message, His burden that comes on me. And by the way, good news comes to sinners. There is nobody who gets saved who deserves to be saved. I don't deserve to be saved. But God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to save me, even me. Mark 1 says, the beginning of the gospel, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before me. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make His path straight. So the message from God, the message from God for bad times is the good news of His salvation. That's the news we need. And by the way, salvation is from God. I cannot do any amount of good works to earn the salvation that God offers through His Son, Jesus. God is the originator of salvation. He's the provider of salvation. He is the one who's the completer. He's the one who made it possible for me to be saved because Jesus Christ allowed Himself to be crucified and He died for my sin and His blood was shed to Wash me from my sin, and you as well if you're a believer. We are saved from our sin and the judgment of God because God has forgiven us if you put your faith in Jesus and you received Him as your Lord and Savior. In order to be saved, salvation requires us to admit we are a sinner and that we need forgiveness. Jesus taught when the Holy Spirit comes, He would convict the world of sin. Righteousness and judgment. I'm not making that up. That's in John 16, verse 8. And we cannot justify ourselves by comparing ourselves with others. Sometimes people say, well, I'm, I'm a sinner, but I'm a whole lot better than my neighbors. They're worse than I am. Boy, if you ever get that kind of attitude, I'm better than other people, that's pride. Be prepared for the fall. You should have lots of mattresses around you to catch you when you go down. Because anybody that thinks, well, they're worse than I am, friend, then you don't understand the ugliness of any sin. Any sin is terrible. Isaiah 40, verses 3 and 5, is a prediction, a prophecy that this John the Baptist is going to come and make the ways plain for Jesus. And salvation is good news. Here's the good news. The good news is this. God loved you even though you're a sinner. Jesus Christ took your sin on himself. He was crucified for you. He died for you. His body was broken for you. By his blood, God has forgiven us and washed away our sin by the blood of Christ. If you have come to conviction under, of your sin and you ask the Lord to forgive you of your sin and you believe Jesus is the Son of God and you ask Him to forgive you and to be your Savior and Lord of your life, God will save you, forgive you, and give you eternal life and you will be adopted into, grafted into the body of Christ. Nobody can snatch you out of the hand of God if you're a child of God. Anyone who preaches that, that's another gospel. It's an anathema. When people say you can be saved and lose your salvation, that means it must depend upon you. Your salvation does not depend upon you or me. It depends upon what Jesus Christ did for you and for me. It does require a response. We can't say, well, I believe Jesus died for me and just go about our life and do whatever we want. There needs to come a time of repentance. That is a gift of God. He brings you under conviction to say, I know I'm a sinner and I need to be forgiven. Even being under conviction of sin is a gift. It's a blessing from God to say, I see myself as He sees me. I need to be forgiven. And for a person to say, now I have faith, that's a gift to God. A gift to give you the ability to trust in God and to believe on Him for salvation, that's all God. And that is good news. You know what faith is? Faith is the ability to lay hold of or to receive the truth. 
that Jesus Christ died for you. The last thing is forgiveness comes to those who repent. You have to repent of your sin. You cannot just keep going and going. And John came baptizing in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance. Unfortunately, it says in English, for remission of sin. That makes it sound like if I get baptized, then my sin's washed away. That's not true. The reason you're baptized is because Jesus died for you and you are doing it as an act of obedience. Baptism is an outward sign of your death to self. Baptism is not a picture of washing. It's a picture of burial. Burial to my old self, old Rick, and he needs to say dead and buried. Dead, buried in the water, that's a picture of my death to my old way. And when I'm raised up out of that water, it's a picture of I've been born again by grace from God, through faith, which is a gift of God, and that I put my trust in God, received Him as my Savior, and I don't want to live for me anymore. I want to live for Jesus. So I'm dead to Rick. I want to live for Jesus. That's what true baptism is about. It's an act of obedience, and it's a picture of dying and being buried and raised again. It says, all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sin. What they were doing is come up confessing their sin and putting their faith in God as much as they understood at that point, because Jesus hadn't died yet. They didn't completely understand, but they came out and they confessed their sin and then John baptized them as a sign they died to their old way of I want to do what I want to do in my own eyes. That's the death and the burial. It's the burial to the old way. Of worldly living. <laughs> One ele and that dies hard. One elementary school teacher was talking to her children about the dangers of not bundling up properly. It's hard for us to imagine where we live. But in some places it gets so cold you have to bundle up and wear your uh, mittens and your cap and your long john underwears and so forth and your snowsuit. Anyway, this boy went sledding one day against his parents' instruction. He caught pneumonia and he died. When she finished the story, one little boy raised his hand and he said, Mrs. Johnson, may I ask two questions? She said, sure, go ahead, Tommy. And the teacher, and the teacher replied, the, the little boy said, who has a sled now? And could I have it? He didn't hear a thing that she said about listening to your parents and obeying what your parents tell you because that will protect you. What he was hearing is, a boy died, there's a sled loose out there somewhere. I want it. I want to go sledding. Isn't that the way most of us are? We're looking for some way to go have fun and do the things of the world. And we forget the whole story, which is to give honor to God and to the parents He's provided for us or others in authority over us. Listen to them for our own good. Anyway, the Hebrew text of this whole passage is Isaiah 40, verse 5. It says, The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. That means see it is God's glory. In Luke it says all flesh will see the salvation of God. That's actually not from the Hebrew. That's from the Greek Septuagint. It doesn't say that. What it really says is the glory of the Lord should be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. What that means is we'll see the glory of the Lord. You know what the glory of the Lord is? It's when somebody gets saved and we see God manifested in your life. When you're saved and you begin acting and thinking like and talking like and doing like Jesus, that's the glory of God. The glory is the the glory of God is when Jesus is revealed in you. He's manifested in you. That glorifies God. When he God looks down and he sees you acting like him. When God sees you acting like his son, that glorifies and honors God. That's what he's looking for. That's <laughs> That's what that passage is about. Anyway, salvation explains the way that men will see God's glory is through His saving work in Jesus Christ. That's how you see glory. You know what? There's a huge difference between the darkness of the world and the glory or the light of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Steve's going to come. He's going to lead us in the song of invitation. And uh, I want to invite you to stand with me now and sing. Somebody in this room today might say, Pastor Rick, I've never prayed to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. Please stand with us.
I've never received Jesus as my Savior, and I need to receive Jesus today. If that's talking to you, you need to get right with God now, because you don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. You don't know if you've got another week. Second, there may be somebody says, Pastor Rick, I need a church home. I've been looking for a church home that preaches the Word of God as it is. And I want to be involved in that church and be part of it. If that's you, then I invite you to come and place your membership in this church. Whatever God's saying, obey Him because He's the Lord. We serve Him.